You're listening to the best travel podcast ever with Eric Hastings. Yeah, well. well, let me prove that to you. Now, everybody calm down for heaven's sakes. Welcome back to the best travel podcast ever. I am your host with the most, your in flight entertainment for the next few minutes. This podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. The entire episode is also available on YouTube at ericthetravelguy.com. I am incredibly excited about this discussion because the more information you have, the better you're going to be. And that is sort of a universal truth in the world, but certainly when it comes to travel. Uh, there are phrases like contract of carriage, tarmac delays. We're going to focus in just a little bit uh, about air travel, but certainly this is all relative to other modes of travel. That's why I am incredibly excited uh, to have Charles Leoka here. He's the president and co-founder of Travelers United. You know what? I forgot, Charlie. Did I actually say your last name right? You did. Perfect. I rarely refer to you that way. It's either Charles or Charlie. <laughs> I, as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, I never confirmed that here today. So sorry about that. Well, welcome to the program, okay. my friend. Well, I'm really glad that I can make it. It turns This is a perfect time to talk to you. Well, you know, by the time we hear this, if I understand the timeline right, you've already built yourself in a return visit because we're going to need to hear uh, the results of you're going to go, well, you're based in Washington, but you're going to go up to the hill. Is that right? Uh, on Tuesday of next week, did you say? We've got about six different uh, consumer groups, probably six people from DOT, because anytime the uh, secretary speaks, he has to move with an entourage. And so <laughs> then we are, um, and so we'll be talking with the secretary, uh, Buttigieg, and it's, it should be really interesting. This will be the first time uh, that he's even um, managed to speak with consumers. And I started a petition that said we wanted to meet with him uh, back about three weeks ago, or about a month ago, probably. And what I did is I sent all of the emails, the first hundred or so, directly to his personal email address. And that really upset a lot of people. Oh, no. Well, but, of course. You knew it was going to. Guess what? <laughs> but guess what? All of a sudden, I said, well, just there's no consumer uh, email for a regular old person to write to. So I just thought I'd write to the boss. Well, I did. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that, once again, you know, you and I have talked about this at length over the years. And you and I are both, well, I won't speak for you, but you know I'm a big fan of commercial aviation. And you and I, I do think we share in the fact that we still marvel at modern day aviation we're able to hop on a plane we have some of the best air service uh, in the world we can go anywhere it uh, you know bill gates is quoted as saying it was really uh, the invention of flight was really the first internet that brings us all together but again all that being said it doesn't always work out the way it's supposed to in terms of flying and travel in general but i mean again eight times out of 10, seven times out of 10, call it whatever you want. It does work out. But we're really talking, right. we're, we're really focused in on what happens and what are your rights when that flight doesn't work out. And I think that that's a nice starting point, even though I know, of course, Travelers United is, is broader than that. But do you mind if we start there? What Can you help me with what a contract of carriage really is? And is that even the right term anymore these days? Oh, yes, it is the right term. So, okay, if we're going to start off with the contract of carriage, so the contract of carriage is what you actually agree to every time you buy an airline ticket. Sometimes it's a 70 or 80 page document. They talk about everything from flights not going to being bumped off of a flight right. uh, with all the rules and regulations, uh, all the different types of ticket itineraries that you end up with. And, and where you can change it and how much it will cost you to change flights and so on and so forth. It's a very complex document. Got it. And so in the old days, we used to have on our tickets, and this is something I've been fighting for as recently as yesterday to get it into this meeting with the Secretary of Transportation, we used to have all the comp compensatory contracts of, of carriage. In other words, if you got bumped off of a flight, you got so much money if you're going to be four hours late, you got no money if you're only going to be less than an hour late and so on. And that was printed on your ticket. Got it. If they lost your luggage, if they damaged your luggage, if they delayed your luggage, you got a certain amount of compensation. 
And that was always printed on the ticket. That was basically it in the old days. Now we were trying to get the new European uh, rules for transatlantic flight delays, mm -hmm. but they're fighting it and they say that's not their job at DOT and blah, blah, blah. However, one thing I have really pushed like that is to get the Department of Transportation's email address on there for the email complaint form. And if we can get that done, then we get more email complaints to go to DOT. Now, we run into problems. The airlines don't like the complaints to go to DOT because that gets them in trouble. Right. They would rather have the complaints go to them. Okay. And but they don't want but they don't want any complaints either. Right. And then a DOT, if they get more complaints, they have to hire more people and they have to handle more complaints. Uh, and then what happens is, and this we got done back in twenty twelve, if you send a complaint to an airline or to DOT and then they forward it to the airline, which is really the best way to do it. If they forward that to the airline or you send it yourself, the airline must respond and acknowledge the receipt of your complaint within 30 days. And then they have another 30 days, up to 60 days, before they have to give you a substantive response to solve your problem. Got it. And I think that that's just an amazing, it's an amazing benefit for American travelers. Absolutely. And before, before 2012, you could wait forever. You know, throwing a complaint in the, to, to DOTs was like dropping a, you know, throwing it out the window on a dark and stormy night. But, <laughs> you know, now we've got it set up. So it, it, everything's registered and it must be responded to. Well, And that makes a really big difference. It does make a big difference. And, again, what we have seen in the recent past is not only did people not know where to go, to lodge a complaint either in real time or after the fact, but we're also seeing you, they'll just go to Twitter and say, you know what, I'm sitting on this airplane for nine hours, and that's not good for anybody either, although it's really good to help get the word out. Right, and, and one thing that I have tried to do is with Twitter and Facebook, I've been working with the Department of Transportation to see if they can put together a complaint form and that you can just fill out uh, on social media as well as having to call or send an email. Uh, that I have still not been successful with the airlines. However, another part of flying is always TSA going through security. Right. Now there, we do have that set up with TSA. We've got it's, it's hashtag ask TSA and therefore, or the uh, ampersand ask TSA, either one, depending upon the systems you're using, then they get that message and they respond very, very quickly. And there's a lot of airlines now that do this, and you get those kind of responses almost happen in real time. Right. Because they're very, everybody can see exactly what's happening, and that puts even more pressure on them to respond to you positively and quickly. Uh, I have a question about uh, tarmac delays and the tarmac delay rules and the changes. Would you, I mean, you know, in the next 18 seconds, can you? Help us out in, if you like how I did that for you. Right. Uh, help us out with passengers that, once again, I, I, I must state this, uh, you know, the, the sheer volume and numbers. I think we as consumers are always just a little bit shocked and surprised at how many people are moving about via commercial airliners 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I must point out again, which I know you would agree with me, running an airline is not exactly an easy business to be in. And God forbid you actually make a profit doing that. It's not an easy job, especially because you're moving people. And at the end of the day, people, we kind of look at it like, yeah, well, are you going to take off, and then are you going to land where you say you're going to land, and are you not going to crash, and are you going to get my bags there too? Like, fundamentally, yeah. that's what we're looking for. But there is a little bit more to that when it doesn't go the way it was scheduled to go. And tarmac delay exactly. is a big, a big part of it, right? Right. And now we got tarmac delay rules put in place back in 2012 as well. Mm -hmm. and, those, and those rules... Uh, were put into place because of problems that they had in terms of snowstorms and the airlines wanting to get people off to their uh, destination, but they would take it off and you'd sit on the tarmac for about three hours, sometimes longer. Some people sat for four and five and six hours. Right. And 
the uh, the toilets on the planes would be overflowing. Kids were screaming and yelling, and it really wasn't a good situation. Kind of sounds so, like my first the, apartment in New York, Charlie. But whatever. That's, I don't mean to interrupt. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> very, 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 very good. Uh, it sounds to me like the old Italian train system when I used to grow up in it, when I grew up in Italy. Yes, that's but, exactly um, right. <laughs> however, you know what we did is we got it set up so that no plane could stay on the tarmac for more than three hours. Then you have to come back. You've got to give everybody a chance to get off and walk around, stretch your legs. Then they can go back out. Now uh, the airlines complained viciously about that. Yeah. Uh, frequent flyers complained about that. But the normal person, and I think only about something like 10% of the people fly once a year, only for the holidays. Right. And everybody else is a, is a, a business uh, traveler normally. So, but the business travelers want to get to where they're going and they, they don't care what time they get there. If they get there at midnight or two in the morning, they've got a hotel and they just get in a cab, they're there. Right. But people who have friends waiting, they've got dinners to go to, they've got screaming children with them, they want it, they want the break. And I so do we got think, that set up. You know what, and I, Charlie, I'm so glad you mentioned this too, and I'm glad this is kind of where we are here. And again, I know you must come back and because we could do this for hours. But but the reality of it is you're bringing up another entity that's really important to understand here too. Not only do you have these airlines Usually in airports, you have multiple airlines. So now you also have introduced the notion of now you have airports. One would might be listening to us today and saying, well, why in the world would they push back from the gate and not know that they can't take off? And again, yeah. this is where I don't want to say ignorance is bliss, but the more you understand of that kind of, I don't want to say game, but really orchestration comes into play. You got to remember how many times, Charlie, have you heard somebody say, well, what do you mean it's a weather delay? The weather is fine here. And yet we're yeah. like, yeah, it's not the weather here. It's the weather where you're going. <laughs> or it's the weather in route. Or in between. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Again, I think the more we understand that, of course, airlines, because if I understand it correctly, too, remember those pilots and those flight attendants, I don't think they get paid till that door gets closed, correct? Or until they take off. I can't remember what it is. Well, I think it's when they when they unblock the plane. Yeah. So they close the door and then they unblock it and they push back. Yeah. But uh, when we're talking about tarmac term, delays, those rules will be changing very soon. But it's not a big change. Okay. Uh, what they do, what they say now is that if you're on a plane, you have to have the plane back to the gate within uh, three hours of when you left the gate. And many times, pilots had to guess how long it would take them to work their way back. But now. They can stay out on the runway for three hours. When they hit the three-hour point, then they turn up and they go back to the terminal. And that's the big change. And here we had a lot of consumer groups being very upset about it. Personally, I thought it was a very logical kind of rule because it gives the airline a real time they have to turn back. Yeah. And heaven forbid they already have enough problems if there's if so much snowfall that they can't even take off. So uh, I think that it, it turned out okay. And that's, that's a new rule, which will probably happen this year uh, for sure. And uh, then we've got a whole bunch of other stuff as well, well that we're looking at. Well, and that's just it. I mean, we when you come back and visit, I want to talk about denied boarding compensation. I want to talk about damage, delayed, lost luggage. Uh, you know, the airlines don't lose as much luggage as you might think that they do, but you are entitled to compensation if they do, uh, if it's delayed. But I think one of the things I'd love to end with today with you is, is that full, fair advertising rule. And I think that's a really important topic for people to realize that's a real thing, correct? It is a real thing. Uh, and it's not as full, fair as I want it to be. However, it does, when you see the price of an airline uh, or, or a flight in any kind of a publication, you'll see cost you $750. Now, that includes all taxes, and all mandatory fees. So when you go up and you say, I want to get a flight from here to there, and they say, it'll be $750, good. That's what you pay them. You don't have to pay, it's not $750 plus tax, not $700, $750 plus fees. Now, if you decide while you're buying your ticket that you want to get an, a seat reservation and you want to uh, uh, have an extra bag and so on, that then calls cost extra and that is up to you 
And most of the time, the airline will sell you the full fare, you know, seven hundred and fifty dollars ticket. And then when you're ready to go, they're not going to increase it up to twenty dollars or fifty dollars a bag or something from twenty five. Uh, they will sell you the, the same, and this is also by law now, the same uh, extra fee for a seat reservation or for a um, baggage uh, check bag that they would have done in, initially. So maybe you've decided that the flight is wide open. You don't need a seat reservation. Right. You don't have to buy it. If you decide that you don't want to check your bags, you're just going to carry them on, you can do that as well. So you've got more options now, and uh, you can... However, things like mandatory fees must be all included in the price. If they have an, an optional fee, like your baggage, like uh, getting on the plane early, like listening to Wi-Fi and so on, then that is a, um, it's an extra charge, and that will be on top of the $750. But if you don't, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, but do I understand this correct, though? If let's just say, for instance, we're just using a round number. If I'm booking my $750 ticket on X airline and I decide, uh, yeah, I'm going to check my bag and I tell them about it in my reservation and they charge me just for fun $10. Are you saying right. that if I did not opt for that $10 charge at the time of my booking, if I head up to the airport or at some later time between now and my departure time, that it will still be $10? Or do the airlines have the right to say, well, now that you waited till the last minute, it's $15. Can they still do that? No, it's it, everything is, uh, none of the extra fees should be changed. They're all based upon the date that you purchased your ticket. And that's where the contract of carriage comes into place. In the contract of carriage, it will tell you exactly how much all these extra charges are. And those are the extra charges you will be responsible for when the plane does take off. I love how you brought it around to the top there. I see what you did there, Charlie, and I appreciate that. It sounds like you've done this a couple of times before. <laughs> I, I just wanted to I wanted to put it together with what we talked about earlier. <laughs> well, you did a hell of a job. Will you come back and tell me uh, how the meeting uh, went uh, next week? But Again, by the time you hear this, you, this will have already happened, so we'll have to do another episode together. Would, would you mind? I would love to hear the... Uh, I would love to hear that. And can people go to the website to Travelers United and can they support your, because you're a nonprofit, right? Right. We're a nonprofit. We're a membership organization. They can go anytime they want to travelersunited.org. On the .org page up in the upper right-hand corner, we've got a, uh, a join us pay button. And we've got a membership program where if you, it's called Travelers United Plus. And if you're a member, you can get a VPN, which gives you secure web service anywhere in the world. Oh, wow. Then you also, we also have a server in Switzerland, which is governed by Swiss privacy rules. So anything you want to keep really private, leave it there and it's really secure. It's all in a big underground cave somewhere, they tell me. <laughs> and then the third thing is, is that we do have a password manager program. So oh, if fine. you've got passwords, you don't have to remember them all. You just go use this password manager program. And that runs something like $50 a year. And it can, it has everything in it. And so you'll save about $100 just right there. And you'll be supporting us at the same time. Hey, I have a question for you before we wrap it up. How are the airlines doing, in your opinion? Well, right now, the airlines have a real problem. The entire travel system sort of turned on a dime. One day, everybody was wearing masks and afraid to travel. Yep. The next day, oh, go, you can do anything you want to do. Right. And then they said all vaccinated people can go uh, on a trip, but nobody's allowed to ask you if you're vaccinated or not. Right. So hence we have everybody wearing masks or not wearing masks, depending upon what the rules are. Right now, the big problem that the airlines have is that they just don't have enough people to take care of all the passengers. They don't have enough airline pilots. They don't have enough uh, flight attendants. And so we're going through a short period right now. I think we'll be all taken care of probably in around the early September mm -hmm. or by sure by the beginning of October. We, we're in a situation where they just don't have enough people to take care of everyone. TSA doesn't have enough uh, officers to even really handle the TSA and keep the line short. So whenever you go to the airport, you're going to have to – First, you wait in line to check your bag. Then you're going to have to wait in line to get through TSA. 
And then just when you say, thank God, I'm done, I'm going to go have a cup of coffee, then you find out you have to wait in line for an hour to get a cup of coffee. Right. And by the time you get to the, to the gate, you're really irritated. So um, <laughs> it, it, it's not a great time to travel right now, but, if you, but at least we can travel. Well, at least we can travel. And, you know, doesn't that come back to us, to Charlie? And I appreciate you saying that because, of course, I, I do defend the airlines quite a bit. And I understand, you know, the, the your local restaurant in your town is probably suffering from some of the same problems uh, in terms of labor and also increased demand, uh, almost changing uh, overnight from we're all stuck at our houses. And now, you know, what, 2019 was one of the best years in travel in the history of modern travel, as I recall. Um, right. and, and then we went through 2020, and you can't just park those planes. Those planes have to be parked and maintained and started and turned off. And, and you know, all of this had to go. And then all of a sudden, here we all are. But I do think you're correct in that it starts with us to say, okay, everybody, we're going to put on our happy pants and we're going to get through this because we're not going to, you know, we're not going to walk uh, to Key West. We need to fly there. So everybody just calm down and take a deep breath. Uh, the onus is on us a little bit, isn't it? Well, the onus is on us. However, I think that having all the onus on passengers is wrong. Agreed. Because the entire system is not functioning. And even if it wanted to function, it can't because we just don't have the personnel right now in place. I'll tell you, so, well, somewhere there has to be a middle way. There does. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I'll tell you what I really like. Um, of course, this pandemic was devastating on so many levels. We're not going to talk about that today. But what I think this conversation about air travel and how we're going to do air travel in the future with or without a worldwide health pandemic, that discussion is a move forward from. I don't understand why I'm being nickel and dime by the by the airlines. I love the fact that I hear less and less about that because I really hate explaining inflation to people. And I really <laughs> hate explaining that we have romanticized airplane food when airplane food was never good. And it had relatively nothing to do with uh, the airplane. It had to do with our taste buds. Like, I don't want to I don't want to have that discussion anymore. You want to check a bag? Great. Here's the fee. You want to have a, a carry on? There's the fee. But you want the lowest price? There it is. You know, so yeah. maybe maybe we can move forward. Charlie, thank you for this. OK, and I look forward to coming back and talking to you. Uh, let's stay in touch, and I'd like to do this as often as possible. we got lots to talk about. Absolutely. It's TravelersUnited.org, and we will, uh, well, shoot, there's the music. That's it. It means it's time to go. Thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget, <laughs> it's, I, this is what happens. I get the, I love this conversation. We could do this every week, I tell you. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and at uh, EricTheTravelGuy.com. Thank you very much, you guys, and have a marvelous week, and we'll talk to you again. You've been listening to the best travel podcast ever with Eric Hastings. Don't worry, we will return again.